I'm glad you could join us. Go ahead and stab the like button and stick around for the next untold story. Mia and Alex Grant, a couple from Chicago, eagerly planned a vacation to the remote shores of Lake Kivu in Rwanda, drawn by the lake's renowned beauty and tranquility. They were adventure seekers, always looking for less trodden paths, and Lake Kivu, with its volcanic beaches and dense surrounding jungles, promised a perfect getaway from their bustling city life. They arrived in Rwanda in late June during the dry season, when the skies were clear and the nights were cool. After a day of travel, they reached their lakeside resort, a collection of rustic cabins nestled between lush green hills and the expansive, shimmering lake. The resort was more isolated than they had imagined, with only a few other guests present upon their arrival, adding a sense of exclusivity and solitude to their adventure. The first few days were blissful. Mia and Alex explored the surrounding landscapes, kayaked across the calm waters of the lake, and enjoyed sunsets that painted the sky in hues of orange and red. However, on the third night, the atmosphere shifted. A dense fog rolled in from the lake, unusual for the season, enveloping everything in a thick, opaque veil that muted the sounds of the jungle and obscured the familiar shoreline. That night, as they lay in their cabin, listening to the muffled sounds of the world outside, Mia noticed a subtle, rhythmic, thumping sound. At first, she thought it was her heartbeat echoing in her ears, a reaction to the day's excitement. But as she focused, it became clear that the sound was external, a slow, deliberate thump, thump, thump coming from the direction of the lake. Curious and slightly unnerved, Alex suggested they check it out, thinking perhaps another guest was out for a late night stroll along the docks. Grabbing a flashlight, they ventured out into the fog, the beam of light barely penetrating the dense mist around them. As they walked towards the lake, the thumping grew louder, more insistent. It was not rhythmic like footsteps, but irregular, with a strange, dragging quality to it. The air grew colder as they approached the water's edge, the fog swirling around them as if alive. Reaching the dock, they scanned the murky darkness. The lake was eerily still, the water like black glass under the night sky. The thumping stopped abruptly, replaced by a suffocating silence that seemed to press in on them. Mia felt a chill run down her spine, and Alex gripped her hand tighter, his own unease palpable. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the fog at the far end of the dock. It was human in shape, but moved oddly, limping, dragging one leg as if injured. As it drew closer, they could see that it was a man, drenched from head to toe, water dripping from his clothing, his face hidden by the hood of his jacket. Paralyzed with a mix of fear and curiosity, Mia called out, Hello, do you need help? The figure stopped, tilting its head as if listening, but did not respond. The air around them grew colder, the fog thicker, as if closing in to obscure the strange encounter from the world beyond. Alex stepped forward, intending to offer assistance, but as he moved, the figure raised its head, revealing not the face of a man, but something distorted, almost rotted, with hollow eyes that seemed to burn with an unnatural light. Mia screamed, pulling Alex back, just as the figure lunged toward them, its movements sudden and violent. They ran back to their cabin, the sound of their own breaths loud in their ears, the thumping resumed behind them, faster now, as if giving chase. They reached their cabin and locked themselves inside, hearts pounding, barely daring to breathe as they listened for any signs of their pursuer. Outside, the fog remained, a silent sentinel by the lake, and within it, something malevolent stirred, its intentions as murky as the waters it had emerged from. The story of Mia and Alex's tranquil vacation had taken a sinister turn, the lake no longer a place of beauty, but a haunting ground for something unexplainable, and their adventure was far from over. Inside the safety of their cabin, Mia and Alex huddled together, their breaths shallow, their minds racing with fear and disbelief. The only sound was the occasional creak of the wooden cabin settling into the cool night air, each noise causing them to flinch, expecting the worst. Alex cautiously peered out of the window, the flashlight in his hand casting shaky beams into the thick fog that seemed to press against the glass. Nothing moved outside, and the oppressive silence felt almost as terrifying as the chase they had just endured. What was that thing? Mia whispered her voice trembling. Alex shook his head, 
unable to form a rational explanation. I don't know, but it didn't seem human. The realization that they were dealing with something beyond their understanding made their isolation at the lakeside resort feel even more acute. Determined to find some answers, Alex remembered the old caretaker of the resort, an elderly man named Joseph who had been living by the lake for decades. If anyone knew what lurked in the lake or the fog, it would be him. The next morning, under a sky still heavy with mist, Alex ventured out to find Joseph. The resort seemed deserted, the other guests likely deterred by the unsettling weather. He found Joseph in a small boathouse by the water's edge, repairing an old net. Joseph, we saw something last night, Alex began, recounting the terrifying encounter. The old man listened intently, his eyes not showing surprise, but a deep, resigned concern. When Alex finished, Joseph nodded slowly, his hands pausing over the tangled net. Ah, you've met him then. We call him the Drifter. He's been a tale around these parts for many years, ever since the big floods in 57 washed away half the town. They say he's looking for something or someone. Most nights, he's harmless, just a sorrowful spirit of the lake. But sometimes he gets angry or desperate. Joseph's explanation did little to ease Alex's fear, but it gave him a crucial piece of local lore that suggested they weren't in immediate danger. What does he want? Alex asked, a chill running down his spine. No one really knows. Some say it's revenge. Others believe he's trying to find peace. But whatever you do, don't follow him into the fog. That's where he's strongest, Joseph warned, his tone grave. Reassured but still uneasy, Alex thanked Joseph and returned to Mia, who had spent the morning anxiously waiting. They decided to leave the resort, feeling that the beauty of the lake was overshadowed by the night's terror. However, as they packed their belongings, the fog began to roll in again, thicker and faster than before, as if intent on keeping them at the lake. By the time they were ready to leave, the resort was enveloped in a dense, almost impenetrable fog. Their car, parked a short distance from their cabin, seemed miles away. As they stepped outside, the eerie silence enveloped them, and the thumping sound, slow and rhythmic, began again, echoing through the fog. Mia grabbed Alex's hand, her eyes wide with fear. It's back, she whispered. With their path obscured by the fog and the haunting sound drawing nearer, Mia and Alex faced a terrifying choice. Attempt to navigate through the blinding mist to their car, or stay put and hope for the fog to clear. All while the mysterious drifter lurked nearby, his intentions unknown. Their decision would seal their fate, as the story of their haunted vacation continued to unfold, each moment leading them deeper into a mystery tied to the very heart of Lake Kivu's whispered legends. Alex and Mia, hand in hand, moved slowly towards their car, the opaque fog forcing them to rely on memory for direction. The ground beneath their feet felt unstable, as if the earth itself was shifting with uncertainty. With each step, the thumping grew louder, more insistent, as if the drifter was drawing nearer, his presence felt through the dense, cold mist. They could barely see a few feet ahead, and the path they knew so well during the day seemed alien and treacherous now. Alex tried to reassure Mia, but his voice was swallowed by the fog, leaving them in a suffocating silence that amplified their isolation. Suddenly, Mia stumbled over a loose stone, her grip tightening on Alex's hand. Alex caught her just in time, steadying her, but as they paused, the thumping stopped abruptly. The silence was complete, oppressive, and far more terrifying than the sound of their pursuer. They held their breath, listening, waiting for any sign of what lurked in the mist. Then, without warning, a figure emerged from the fog directly in front of them. It was the drifter, his appearance more ghastly up close. His clothes were ragged and soaked, clinging to his skeletal frame. His face was partially obscured by a hood, but what they could see was distorted, waterlogged, with hollow eyes that seemed to glow with a malevolent light. Mia screamed, and Alex pulled her back, but as they turned to run, another figure materialized from the fog behind them. They were surrounded, more figures appearing, each one as grotesque as the last, forming a semicircle around them. The couple realized these were not just echoes of one lost soul, but many. The forgotten victims of the lake bound together by their tragic fates, led by the drifter. The spectral group moved closer, their movements synchronized and slow, deliberate but unstoppable. 
Alex and Mia backed away until they hit the side of their car, the cold metal a harsh reminder of their desperate situation. Alex fumbled for the car keys, his hands shaking as he tried to unlock the door without taking his eyes off the approaching spirits. Just as he managed to open the car door, a strong, cold hand gripped his shoulder, pulling him back with supernatural strength. Mia's screams filled the air as she tried to pull Alex away from the grip of the drifter, but it was too strong. The other spirits closed in, their moaning like the wind passing through the caverns of forgotten souls. Alex managed to push Mia into the car, shouting, Drive! Get away from here! Mia, tears streaming down her face, pulled the door closed and started the car. She looked back through the rear window, her vision blurred by tears and fog, and saw Alex being pulled into the mist by the drifter and his minions, his face a mask of terror and despair as he disappeared into the white void. Mia drove away, sobbing uncontrollably, the car's headlights cutting a feeble path through the fog. She escaped the immediate danger, but left a part of her soul behind at the lake, with Alex and the spectral forms that claimed him. The horrifying ordeal at Lake Kivu would haunt her for the rest of her life. The memory of Alex's final, desperate look, a constant, painful echo of a vacation turned nightmare. And back at the lake, the fog eventually cleared, but the legend of the drifter grew darker and more terrifying, fed by the new sorrow that had joined its ghostly ranks. The story of Lake Kivu continued, its waters as mysterious and menacing as ever, a lurking reminder that some places on Earth are touched by shadows that never fully recede. Jenna and Thomas Fields chose a remote cabin in the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest for their vacation, a place where they could disconnect from the world and reconnect with each other. The cabin, advertised as a peaceful retreat surrounded by nature, promised hiking trails, a nearby lake, and an absence of cell service, a true escape from their hectic urban lives in Seattle. Their drive to the cabin was filled with anticipation and laughter, winding through towering evergreens and misty mountains that gave the journey a dreamlike quality. As they arrived, the cabin stood as described, rustic, charming, and utterly secluded, nestled between the whispering pines and the shadowy outlines of distant mountains. The first day passed in blissful relaxation. They unpacked, explored the surrounding woods, and as night fell, they sat by the fireplace, the crackling fire providing warmth and comfort as they shared stories and plans for the days ahead. On the second day, they decided to hike to the nearby lake, a supposedly short and easy trek according to their host's written guide. The path was well marked initially, the forest alive with the sounds of birds and the rustle of small animals. However, as they ventured deeper, the trail seemed less distinct, the forest denser, and the sounds of wildlife began to recede, replaced by a suffocating silence. Unsettled but determined not to turn back, Jenna and Thomas pressed on until they reached the lake, which lay still and silent, its surface smooth like glass, reflecting the gray skies above. Something about the lake felt off. It was too still, too quiet, as if it were holding its breath. The couple spent little time there, unease growing, before deciding to head back to the cabin. As they retraced their steps, a thick fog began to roll in, rapid and unnatural in its approach. It swallowed the path and obscured their vision, turning their familiar trail into a maze of shadows and half-seen shapes. Jenna clutched Thomas's hand tightly, her heart racing as the visibility dropped to mere feet in front of them. They walked faster, but the cabin seemed frustratingly out of reach. Every turn looked the same, every tree a repeating pattern of the last. Panic began to set in when they realized they were truly lost. It was then they heard it. A low, droning sound, not quite a growl, not quite a whisper, echoing softly through the trees. Frightened, but with no other option, they followed the sound, hoping it might lead them back to the cabin or to another hiker. Instead, the source remained elusive, always just out of sight leading them deeper into the fog. Night fell, and with no way to call for help, Jenna and Thomas found themselves wandering aimlessly, cold and scared. Suddenly, the sound stopped, and in the chilling silence that followed, they stumbled upon a clearing. In the middle stood an old, decrepit cabin, its windows dark, its structure leaning slightly as if about to collapse. Curiosity overcame their fear, compelling them to approach. The cabin door was slightly ajar, creaking ominously as they pushed it open. 
Inside, the air was musty, filled with the scent of mold and something else. Something rotten. By the light of Thomas's flashlight, they explored the one-room cabin, noticing an old dusty book on a table. As Thomas picked up the book, the cabin suddenly felt colder, the air thicker. He opened the book to a random page, and they found it was a journal, dating back decades. The entries spoke of the cabin, the lake, and a chilling warning. Do not listen to the whispers from the water. The sound returned, louder now, more insistent. Jenna and Thomas realized too late that the forest had lured them into its deepest secret, a place not meant for the living. The story of their peaceful vacation had taken a dark turn into the realm of forgotten lore and warnings unheeded. As they stood in the old cabin, surrounded by the encroaching darkness and the echoing drone, the true horror of their situation began to dawn on them, their escape uncertain, their fate tied to the mysterious, whispering lake. As the haunting drone intensified around them, Jenna and Thomas felt an icy grip of fear tighten around their hearts. The air inside the decrepit cabin seemed to pulsate with a life of its own, the whispers growing louder, as if converging upon the old structure. They clung to each other, realizing that their curiosity had led them into a trap they did not understand. Trying to remain rational, Thomas flipped through more pages of the journal, hoping to find something, anything that could guide them out of this nightmare. The entries were erratic, filled with scribbles of paranoia and fear from the previous occupant, a lone fisherman who had lived by the lake decades ago. His writings became increasingly disturbed over time, mentioning shadows in the woods and voices that called to him from the lake at night, voices that promised secrets of the deep if only he'd walk into the water. Jenna urged Thomas to leave the book and search for a way back to their cabin, but as they turned to leave, they realized that the door they had entered through was gone. In its place was just a solid wall, the wood old and rotting. Frantically, they searched for an exit, but the windows were too high and barred with thick, unyielding branches. The whispers in the cabin crescendoed into discernible voices, no longer just echoes of the wind, but clear, seductive murmurings promising release and unimaginable truths just outside in the darkness. Jenna covered her ears, trying to block out the voices while Thomas, desperate and scared, yelled into the void, demanding silence. Suddenly, the voices stopped. The silence slammed down like a physical barrier, heavy and oppressive. Then, a new sound began, a soft, melodic humming that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the cabin. The floorboards trembled subtly underfoot, as if the building itself was awakening from a long slumber. As they stood frozen in fear, the center of the room began to warp and sink, forming a shallow basin in the wooden floor. Water started seeping through the cracks, cold and dark, filling the basin rapidly. The water's surface reflected no light. Instead, it absorbed it, creating a void that seemed to pull at their very souls. Thomas grabbed Jenna's hand, pulling her back to the farthest corner of the room as the water continued to rise, now spilling over the basin's edge, creeping toward their feet. The cabin felt alive, the walls creaking rhythmically, as if breathing, and the humming growing louder, now underscored by a faint but distinct heartbeat. Trapped and terrified, they watched as figures began to form in the water, dark shapes that twisted slowly, faces and hands pressing up from beneath the surface, reaching toward them with a silent plea. The faces were tormented, eternally trapped within the lake's depths, their eyes hollow pools of despair. The realization hit Jenna and Thomas with chilling clarity. The lake, the cabin, the voices. They were all part of a sentient, malevolent entity that fed on the souls of those it ensnared. The previous inhabitant had succumbed to its call, and now they were its newest victims, caught in an unending nightmare. With the water now lapping at their ankles, the couple understood that their only chance of survival lay in unraveling the secrets held by the cabin and the lake. As they faced the dark waters rising around them, their fight for survival became a battle against the very essence of the lake's ancient, whispering darkness. As the water continued to rise, engulfing the cabin floor and creeping up their legs, Jenna and Thomas realized they were running out of time. The figures in the water grew more defined, more desperate, clawing at the air above the dark surface. The whole cabin now seemed to pulse with a dark life of its own the walls groaning under the strain of whatever unnatural force possessed them. Panicking but determined to survive, Thomas remembered the fisherman's journal. 
He waded through the rising water back to the table, flipping through the soaked pages, searching for anything that might help them break the cycle of torment. Jenna held back, watching the figures in the water, their haunting faces etched with sorrow and pain, a stark reminder of their possible fate. Suddenly, Thomas found it, a passage where the fisherman mentioned a ritual, something he had contemplated but ultimately feared too much to perform. It spoke of a chant and an offering, something to appease the lake's spirit, a way to calm the whispering voices. With no other options and the water now waist deep, Thomas shouted the plan to Jenna. Together, they began reciting the chant from the journal, their voices shaky but growing stronger with desperation. As they chanted, the figures in the water seemed to react, their movements slowing, their expressions softening. Encouraged, Thomas and Jenna continued, their words blending into the humming that filled the cabin. Then, as the final line of the chant was spoken, they felt the cabin shudder, a deep, resonating tremble that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. The water stopped rising. For a moment, there was silence, the kind of silence that presses against your ears and fills your mind with nothingness. Then, with a sound like a heart breaking, the floor beneath them collapsed. Thomas and Jenna fell into the dark waters, the cold shock stealing their breath away. They tried to swim to the surface, but the water was no longer just water. It was a living, pulling force dragging them deeper into the abyss. Around them, the figures in the water no longer seemed sorrowful, but welcoming, their hands guiding the couple further into the depths. As they were pulled down, down into the dark heart of the lake, the last thing Jenna saw was the cabin above them, distorting and finally disintegrating into the water, swallowed whole by the lake. The whispering voices crescendoed into a triumphant, eerie chorus that filled the water around them, celebrating new additions to their eternal, watery prison. The surface of Lake Kivu closed over where the cabin once stood, the water becoming still once more, as if nothing had ever disturbed its peace. The whispers quieted, but the lake kept its secrets, dark and deep, waiting for the next souls brave or foolish enough to disturb its slumber. Carrie and Derek had always dreamed of exploring the lush wilderness of the Amazon rainforest. They were seasoned travelers, eager for adventure, and enamored with the idea of venturing into one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. They booked a guided tour that promised an immersive experience into the heart of the jungle, complete with riverboat travel and stays in eco-friendly lodges hidden deep within the rainforest. Their journey began in Manaus, Brazil, where they met their guide, Marco, a native with extensive knowledge of the Amazon's flora and fauna. The first part of their adventure involved a long boat ride along the winding rivers that cut through the dense jungle. The sights and sounds were overwhelming. Vibrant birds flew overhead, monkeys chattered in the treetops, and the air was thick with the buzz of insects. As they traveled deeper into the jungle, the riverbanks grew tighter, the trees taller, and the sounds of civilization faded away until all that remained was the raw, unfiltered chorus of the wild. Each night, they anchored near the shore, where the dense canopy of the jungle stretched out like a dark, endless sea around them. On the third night, after a day of exploring a particularly remote area, the atmosphere changed. The air grew heavy, and a tense silence fell over the jungle, a stark contrast to the constant symphony of wildlife they had become accustomed to. Carrie felt a chill run down her spine, and Derek's usual upbeat demeanor shifted towards unease. That evening, as they sat around a small campfire near the riverbank, Marco shared stories of the jungle, including tales of the Yakuruna. According to local lore, the Yakuruna are water spirits that inhabit the rivers of the Amazon, often described as shapeshifters who can control aquatic animals and are known to lure humans into the water to steal their souls. The story fascinated Carrie and Derek, though they took it as little more than an intriguing myth, a piece of the Amazon's rich tapestry of legends. But later that night, as they lay in their tent, the strange silence persisted, unnervingly deep and complete. Suddenly, a splash from the nearby river pierced the stillness, followed by a low humming sound that seemed both near and far, echoing through the trees. Curious and unable to sleep, Carrie whispered to Derek that she was going to check it out. Grabbing a flashlight, she quietly unzipped the tent and stepped out into the cool night air. The moon cast a pale light over the river, creating a surreal, 
almost ethereal scene. As she approached the riverbank, the humming grew louder, a mesmerizing melody that seemed to resonate with the flowing water. Peering into the river, Carrie saw what looked like flickering shadows just beneath the surface, shifting and swirling in patterns that made her head spin if she looked too long. Suddenly, Derek's voice called out from behind her, snapping her out of her trance. He had followed her, worried about what she was doing alone by the river at night. As he reached her side, they both noticed a figure emerging from the other side of the river. It was human-like but moved with an eerie grace, its eyes reflecting the moonlight like those of a nocturnal animal. Frozen in place, Carrie and Derek watched as the figure paused at the water's edge, then turned to face them directly. It raised a hand, beckoning them closer with a gesture that was almost inviting. The humming intensified, filling their ears with a sound that was impossible to ignore. As they stood there, caught between curiosity and fear, they realized that the legends of the jungle might hold more truth than they had ever imagined. The story of their adventure in the Amazon was far from over, and as the figure continued to beckon, they knew that their encounter with the unknown might just be beginning. The mysterious figure across the river seemed to dissolve back into the mists as suddenly as it appeared, leaving Carrie and Derek with a chilling sense of unease. The haunting melody that had filled the air faded away with the figure, and the jungle's usual nocturnal sounds slowly began to creep back into the void left by the silence. Shaken by the encounter, Carrie and Derek hurried back to their tent, the allure of the river's edge now replaced with a palpable dread. Inside, they discussed what they had seen. Derek tried to rationalize it as a trick of the light or a local navigating the river at night, but Carrie couldn't shake the feeling that they had come face to face with something supernatural, something tied to the legends Marco had spoken of. Unable to sleep and driven by a mix of fear and fascination, they decided to speak to Marco at first light. They found him preparing breakfast by a small fire, the morning sun filtering through the dense canopy above. The guide listened intently as they recounted their experience, his expression growing increasingly serious. Marco sat back, his coffee cup paused halfway to his lips. You've seen the Yakuruna, he said in a low, steady tone. It is rare, and it is a sign. The river spirits are guardians of these waters and the jungle. If they show themselves, it is either a warning or a calling. You must be careful. The jungle has many eyes and not all are friendly. His words did little to ease Carrie and Derek's anxiety, but they also ignited a deeper curiosity about the mysteries hidden within the depths of the Amazon. They asked Marco if there were ways to protect themselves or to understand more about what they might be dealing with. Marco nodded, suggesting a visit to a nearby village where an elder resided, someone knowledgeable in the old ways and the spiritual elements of the jungle. Eager for answers, and despite their initial reservations, they agreed to Marco's plan. The journey to the village took them further downriver, the boat cutting smoothly through the water, the jungle on either side watching silently. The village was a small collection of huts on stilts, nestled on the riverbank, seemingly at peace with the encroaching wild. The elder, a small aged man with deeply lined skin and piercing eyes, received them quietly. Marco explained their encounter in the elder's native tongue, every so often glancing at Carrie and Derek to gauge their reactions. The elder listened, nodding slowly, his eyes never leaving the couple's faces. After a long silence, he spoke in a raspy but firm voice, which Marco translated. The river does not simply show itself to anyone without reason. You have been chosen to see, and now you are part of the river's flow. You must make an offering to appease the Yakuruna, to ensure your safety and to prevent the spirits from intertwining your fate with the depths of the waters. Carrie and Derek exchanged uneasy glances. The idea of being chosen by the spirits of the river was overwhelming. They agreed to the elders' instructions, driven by a desire to protect themselves and perhaps a deeper, unspoken desire to connect further with the ancient, mystical world they had stumbled into. The elder instructed them on the offering, simple but specific items they were to place into the river at sunset. As the day waned, they prepared the offering carefully, each item a symbol of respect and peace. As they stood by the river's edge that evening, the jungle around them alive with the sounds of life, they placed the offering into the water, watching as the current gently carried it away. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with streaks of purple and gold, the river reflecting the spectacular display. 
But as darkness fell and they turned to head back to the village, the haunting melody they had heard two nights before filled the air once again, this time stronger, more compelling. They turned back to the river in time to see a swirl of mist forming over the water where their offering had disappeared. Frozen in place, they watched as the mist grew, forming shapes that seemed almost human, the melody weaving around them like a tangible force. As the shapes became clearer, the couple realized that their journey into the mysteries of the Amazon was far from over, and the night ahead promised revelations that would forever change their understanding of the natural and supernatural worlds. The shapes within the mist began to solidify, taking on distinctly human forms that moved with an eerie grace on the surface of the water. The figures were translucent, shimmering under the moonlight that broke through the canopy, casting a silvery glow on the river. The melody intensified, its haunting notes resonating deep within Carrie and Derek's bones, compelling them to remain rooted to the spot, despite their growing fear. As they watched, entranced, the figures began to dance, a slow ceremonial movement that was both beautiful and unsettling. The water around their feet seemed to pulse with a life of its own, drawing the couple closer to the edge. Marco, standing a few steps behind them, whispered urgently in a tense voice, Do not step into the water. No matter what you see or hear, stay on the land. The figures in the mist seemed to hear Marco's warning, and one by one they turned their gaze towards the trio on the bank. Their eyes were hollow yet luminous, filled with an ancient sadness and a longing that tugged at Carrie and Derek's hearts. One figure, more distinct than the others, stepped forward, its form clearer now, revealing the delicate features of a woman. She stretched out her hand towards Carrie, who felt an overwhelming desire to take it. Derek, sensing the danger, grasped Carrie's arm tightly, pulling her back. The spell momentarily broken, Carrie blinked, her mind clearing just enough to realize how close she had come to stepping into the river. The woman in the mist let out a mournful wail, a sound so full of despair and entreaty that it felt like a physical blow. The melody grew discordant, aggressive. The water began to churn, and the mist thickened, swirling around the spectral figures who now seemed to be pleading with them, their voices merging into a cacophony of whispers that filled the air. Derek and Carrie, overwhelmed by fear and confusion, stumbled back, their minds racing for a way to escape the terrifying spectacle. As they retreated, the ground beneath their feet gave way unexpectedly, a hidden erosion from the riverbank that hadn't been visible. Derek managed to catch himself, but Carrie, less fortunate, fell towards the water's edge. Derek lunged forward, catching her hand, just as she was about to fall into the swirling river, now teeming with ghostly figures. The spectral woman reached out again, her hand inches from Carrie's, her touch almost a promise of endless depths and cold embraces. Derek, with every ounce of his strength, pulled Carrie back from the precipice, the spectral woman's touch grazing Carrie's fingers, leaving a trace of icy cold that ran up her arm. They scrambled up the bank, not stopping until they reached the safety of the village, where the elder and other villagers awaited, their faces etched with concern and understanding. Behind them, the melody faded, and the mist receded, but the river never truly returned to normal. It now held a menace, a memory of what had almost claimed them. That night, as they lay in a hut provided by the villagers, Carrie and Derek listened to the distant sounds of the river, the water whispering promises of return. They knew they would leave the Amazon the next day, but the haunting melody and the ghostly figures would follow them, lingering in their dreams and waking thoughts. Their adventure had sought to explore the beauty of the Amazon, but instead, they had uncovered its ancient, terrifying secrets, learning firsthand that some mysteries are better left undiscovered, and some rivers, like the one flowing endlessly outside their temporary refuge, carry souls and songs that are never meant to be silenced. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video, 